and then um, went to high school there. That was it. Now the others, I have no clue. <laughs> I guess I would go around to the front, to the back, wherever, like, wherever there was a lab. I would go to that in there and go, okay, that's it. Hired me. So you know what it's for. And I've been an appraiser ever since then. Uh, I got my license in 2005 as a uh, certified residential appraiser. And um, we've been uh, working <laughs> really hard <laughs> for the past two years. It's been very busy and we've had a lot of success. And my uh, uh, partner, Stephen Campbell, and I have been really happy with the way the business has gone and we've really grown a lot. And uh, we're just doing really well right now. And we're really happy about that, of course. We're doing really well because the market's doing really well, of course. Um, but uh, basically, I'm just going to start. Um, I don't know how much y'all know about the appraisal profession. Um, basically, to be an appraiser, you have to find a sponsor uh, or a supervisor who will take you on and train you um, for you know an amount of time to uh, show you basic the basics of uh, uh, being an appraiser. Um, so what you have to do is you have to apply to the state to be a trainee uh, and to do that, you have to take 75 hours of qualifying education uh, for which includes a trainee supervisor course, which basically outlines the do's and don'ts of trainees and supervisors. And I have to take that class every two years uh, just to keep up with the profession and what has changed, what, what changes <laughs> seems like almost yearly now with uh, the state. Um, you also have to be fingerprinted and also have to have a background check uh, to uh, fill in that application. Um, the training license is good for two years. Uh, once you receive it, uh, after you receive it, you can uh, apply. You want to basically after you get it, you want to move on and get licensed as an appraiser. But if you don't do your required education or training in that amount of two years' time, you can get an extension. Um, the highest level is a certified general appraiser, and basically with that license, you can do anything, any commercial property, any residential property. Um, and to do that, you have to have 225 hours of additional education in addition to the 75 of a trainee over the first two years of your uh, training period. And you must have a college degree. Um, and in those two years, you must have 3,000 hours of um, appraisal experience, 1,500 of which has to be residential. Uh, the next lowest uh, or the next uh, appraiser license under that is a certified residential appraiser. Uh, that's the license that I have. Um, and the, the process has changed a little bit since I went through it. Um, now you have to have 125 additional hours and 75 training hours, and uh, you have to have taken certain college courses. Uh, when I was a trainee, you didn't have to have a college, any college courses or any degree or anything like that. Uh, and now you have to have 1,500 hours uh, over a minimum of 12 months. Uh, I have one trainee right now who's working towards this, and he's been our trainee since November of 2019. So he's Getting ready to take his licensing test and um, all his classes and apply to be a certified resident or appraiser. Uh, hopefully, he can get that done over the next couple of months because once he gets that, he can start accepting orders in his name, and I don't have to uh, give him orders uh, to do. Um, and he can get orders from lenders and um, do his own thing. Right now, I have to supervise him, which means I have to go to every uh, house that he goes to, and that's very difficult. Uh, to do with both our schedules, working uh, his schedule, my schedule, and then if the refi, the uh, <laughs> refi person's schedule, we have to coordinate on our schedule. So I'm really looking forward to him getting his license so that I don't have to do that. And the lowest level is the uh, licensed residential appraiser. And that with that license, you can do any residential property up to a million dollars. Um, and for that license, you only have to have 75 additional hours uh, and you don't have to have a college uh, degree. There's no college class requirements either. Uh, and to get that license, you have to have a thousand hours of experience over six months. Um, and as a, all appraisers have to take continuing education, uh, and every two years we have to do 28 hours, and those 28 hours must include seven hours of the National Use Plat class. Um, and I know if y'all have been around appraisers or if you have asking questions to appraisers, usually use PAP will come up basically. USPAP is the uh, Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. And it just basically, um, those are the generally recognized ethical and performance standards for the appraisal profession. It tells us how to deal with certain situations, uh, how to deal with clients, who's a client, uh, who's a lender, uh, 
who the intended user of the report is, uh, what's the intended user of the use of the report, uh, tells us how, many, how to keep our records, how long we have to keep our records, and it tells us uh, basically you know, what needs to be included in the report, scope of work, stuff like that. Um, and that changes uh, every two years as well. Uh, that's why we have to do an update every two years. Um, they review it every two years and make changes, minor changes. Sometimes they make major changes, but there haven't been any major changes in a couple of years. But um, you know, they do have little, um, what they're called, recommendations that they come out with every two years. Um, so that's the basics of being an appraiser. Um, <coughs> current issues that we're dealing with right now, obviously COVID. Um, we uh, did see a minor slowdown in March and April of 2020, but after that, I mean, everything's been crazy. Um, of course, we've had to deal with uh, wearing masks or um, personal protective equipment. Uh, a lot of our lenders have required that we wear masks to appointments. Um, our gloves if we can, or um, and even uh, we've been asked to do appraisals that are just drive-bys uh, on certain occasions when the uh, client didn't want us to go inside the house, uh, which is fine, and we could do that, but uh, on those appraisals, usually they come back three or four months later and ask us to do a full appraisal um, because, <laughs> you know, you can't do a real appraisal if you're not seeing the inside of the house. Um, unless you have photo evidence or something like that. So um, basically in San Antonio, we hadn't seen any uh, COVID effects. Um, there's only two subdivisions that I know of that really didn't, uh, that really didn't keep up with the market. And those were um, the Amorosa and uh, Campanians over in Silo uh, Canyon. Um, I was doing appraisals in there and I was doing an appraisal in there in December and you can see a, a very large slowdown and decrease in prices in those two subdivisions. But other than that, that's the only two areas that I've seen all San Antonio that have had any effect. Amorosa, um, it's the Sibley. Um, and the only reason that uh, talking with the realtor uh, in that situation was the only reason that we could figure out is because those two communities have older uh, populations and you don't want to sell their house, or if they did want to sell their house, they couldn't get any dealings because you know similar buyers weren't looking at houses at that time or looking for that particular product at that time. But um, I haven't been back looking at those uh, subdivisions since December, so I don't know if they've taken off again or just basically what they've done. But it's just, that's the only two weird areas that we came across uh, in all the San Antonio market. Had, uh, uh, Cibolo Canyons, the Amorosa and Campanias uh, neighborhoods, uh, the Sibley neighborhoods, garden homes, where they went, went and built a whole bunch of really nice garden homes. And basically, they marketed them to, um, you know, your 55 and up crowd, um, retirees, and that's just beyond the other also have that tax there too, like TPC. Probably so. Um, it's a little different. Yeah. Tax yeah, um, but <laughs> they're very nice homes. <laughs> but yeah, that's the only, um, the other issue that we're dealing with right now is increase in sales prices. I don't know what y'all have seen, but um, I have two appraisals right now that uh, came in at over $100,000 over the list price. Um, I mean, most of the ones that we're seeing, you know, five, 10, 15 uh, thousand dollars over list price is not unusual right now. Anything that comes in under list price is almost surprising at this point. Uh, but I mean, it's just the nature of the market right now. Uh, lots of buyers uh, and lots of people coming into San Antonio willing to pay a premium for the, um, the homes, uh, which, is, which is good, uh, but you know, <laughs> what do we do at this point? Because uh, the appraisal industry is a backwards looking um, assessment. Um, you know, we can project stuff, but lenders don't like us to do that because you're taking a wild guess, basically. Um, I mean, uh, it could end tomorrow. <laughs> you know, things in the economy could change quickly. Uh, and that's why they don't like us to make those adjustments. Uh, so that's kind of one of the issues that we're dealing with. Also, we're dealing with 
increase in builder prices. I mean, I don't know if y'all have seen that as well. Um, I know one KB subdivision where they increased the base price is fifty thousand dollars, and um, you know we're just we're trying to uh, do these appraisals, and you know um, the comps that they have are fifty thousand dollars lower just because you know they were selling like they made a whole bunch of sales and they have a whole bunch of the contract uh, for the new sales price, but you know we can't make that jump yet because we haven't seen the closings yet. So. That's the other issue that we're dealing with um, right now. Um, basically, um, one thing that I like to inform lenders about is uh, FHA. Um, the best way, if you have an FHA question, is to contact FHA uh, through email. Uh, and the email that they have given the appraisers is answers at hud.gov. Uh, that's what you basically email them. And it takes them about 24 to 48 hours to respond. Um, you know, basic questions like if you have a house that needs to be painted or questions about the paint, or uh, basically if you have a question about the FHA inspection, um, you want to email them. Uh, they're the authority uh, on uh, what goes in this region. They're based in Denver. Uh, and they cover Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, and I think maybe Kansas. But um, that's the email that they give us to answer all our questions. I mean, of course, we take classes uh, through them uh, every two years and do a seminar here in San Antonio and you know, just basically uh, give us an update uh, on what issues they're looking at, what uh, things we need to look at, appraisal reports, um, and uh, Basically, that email address is what they've told us to contact. The best way to contact them, uh, you can send them pictures. Uh, you can, send, you know, basic questions, anything FHA related, they should be able to answer with that email address. Um, what I see the most issues with appraisal, FHA appraisals and the inspection, um, most common peeling paint. Um, it used to be that only holds prior to 1978. If they had peeling paint, you'd have to require them to paint the house, but now you have to, any house built that has peeling paint, you'd have to have them uh, repair the peeling paint. Um, basically, the best way to do that is to paint over it. I know that's probably not the appropriate way to do it, but that's what FHA has told us, just paint over it. Um, I mean, it may not even look good, but you know they're not concerned about how it looks, they're more concerned about the paint issue. Um, also, uh, the second probably most common thing we see is uh, permanent heat source. And the second most common thing we get questions about is FHA houses must have a permanent heat source and a permanent cooling source. Um, and uh, usually what we see is, you know, the house just has a window unit air conditioner with uh, basically both heat and AC, but that doesn't qualify for uh, FHA's requirement. It has to be a permanent heat source. And what they mean by permanent it has to be permanently affixed to the structure and it has to be permanently connected to the electrical outlet. It can't be a plug-in, it has to be a direct connection to electricity. Um, that's probably one of the most common things that we see uh, in, a, in the older houses because they just put an AC in and think that that qualifies. But FHA, I mean, we've gone around and around with FHA on this and they've said, you know, permanently connected Permanently connected to electricity or permanently mounted, permanently connected to electricity. And so that's for, for our intents and purposes, if we're taking a listing and let's say mm -hmm. it's a ranch home that's got a wood burning stove as a heat source in South Texas where we really hardly have winters, mm -hmm. that's that, not FHA. That does not qualify, yeah. Uh, it has to be uh, either a window unit or you know a gas connected um, you know, stove. Those do qualify as well. Um, I don't see those as much as anymore, uh, but uh, most people, because the window units with heat and AC are so cheap, it's just easier to put that in. Plus it's probably a little bit safer. Um, and also the, the last issue that we see are probably uh, no appliances. FHA has come out and said, uh, any kitchen uh, that has a place for a stove, a dishwasher, a microwave, if it's there, if you know it's mounted into the cabinets, or there's a place for it in the cabinet, it has to be installed uh, to, to qualify for FHA. And uh, 
a couple of years ago, they didn't have that requirement. I'm not really sure why they changed it, but um, every house must have to have a kitchen stove. Um, but if there's no place in the cabinets for a dishwasher, they don't require one. If there's no place for a microwave to be mounted, they don't require one. Um, but stove is required. Um, is it the same for VA or is that just for FHA? I would imagine so. I'm not a VA qualified appraiser because I cannot <laughs> get on their appraisal panel. I've tried for years, uh, but there's so many appraisers in uh, Bear County that are on the VA panel. They only open it up uh, every so often. And I'm, last time they did was over 10 years ago. And uh, Jay Schroeder, my previous boss, was a VA appraiser. He was able to get uh, on that panel, but um, they just select a whole bunch at one time and then close it off. And I've emailed every six months asking them, uh, hey, when are you going to open up? And said, well, not this time, not this time. Uh, one of my former associate appraisers uh, is now an appraiser in Pleasanton. And she was able to get on the, play, the Wilson County area. So it's um, one of the counties down there. She was able to get qualified as a VA appraiser down there just because they didn't have any in that county. And so she said, if I wanted to join, I could get, you know, get on down there. But there's no reason for me to do that because once I, I'd only be limited to that county and I don't do appraisals in that county. So. But uh, I'm kind of familiar with VA, but I haven't seen a report done three years or four years, you know, since we uh, uh, separated from Jay, um, since he stopped doing them. Would, be, would it be okay to ask you, I've, I've seen a few VA appraisals come in actually low here mm -hmm. as of late. Um, do you have any kind of insight as to why those may be coming in low when so many others are coming in at sales price? Um, well, <laughs> from what I hear from realtors is that um, VA appraisers are uh, old and ornery and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know um, I haven't seen a VA appraisals in quite a while, so the only ones that Jay did, um, I looked at some of them, but um, I couldn't tell you why other than that, that reason, um, you know, and the, once you've been on the panel for a long time, uh, you probably don't look at, um, updating to common, uh, you know, phrasal methods or basically, um, they're just older and set in their ways. Okay. Um, to that point though, Shane, I think, uh, if you go back to the 2008, 2009 period when all this bubble burst, right? The one industry that took it the hardest was the appraisal industry. Right. Those guys went to jail, right? And those people that are VA appraisers that have been around for a long time probably remember that more than people who aren't in that VA panel that do primarily the FHA and conventional models. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. it could be because true. these guys that are appraising properties $100,000 above this price, so at some point, they're going to be called by the government and into courts and asking why they did that because the banks are going to be in a bad situation. Yeah, <laughs> we're kind but of the fall guy. Yeah, it's yeah, that, that's one of the things that I hear about talking with other appraisers and the other uh, appraisal newsletters and uh, websites that I visit is you know, we're, we're always the one they get rained on um, because you know, uh, and it's, it's, um, my theory is just do, you know, do what the sales show you. Don't try to inflate values, you know, uh, just, you know, make it, uh, just to, uh, be cordial, basically do what the sales tell you, just be honest. So, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, y'all may have already talked about this, but, uh, and I apologize for coming in no. late, but. Um, how do you account for the rising market? How do you, is there some sort of an adjustment that you make? Because builders are bringing up prices every day. Right? Yeah, we're so, we can only be backward looking. Uh, we can't be forward looking with lenders. They don't allow us to do that. Uh, I mean, I can already see within the past three months when we do our. Uh, market conditions addendum. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but it's a 
one sheet page in the back of the, the appraisal that uh, gives a three to six month or zero to three month, six or three to six month and a 12, seven to 12 month history. And um, there are very few uh, MLS runs that I do where the zero to three months is less than 100% right now. And that's telling us market's definitely increasing. Uh, usually you'll see the sales price, the price ratio is in the 90s, 95 to 100%. Um, we would never see over 100% within the past, you know, two or three years that we've been doing this. But within the past few months, I haven't done very many where the sales price to list price ratio is under 100%. Um, yeah, that's telling us that it's definitely increasing. And uh, we can't make adjustments based on that because we don't know what's going to happen in the next three to six months. And lenders don't want us to do that because that gets into, hey, you're inflating the value just based on speculation. Um, so yeah, but we just, you know, try to do the best that we can. And um, I know uh, my, uh, my business partner, Steven, uh, is trying to buy a house right now and he's put offers on six houses and has been outbid on every single one of them by at least $30,000 by people coming to do something by looking at market value? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's trying to be an appraiser and buy a house, yeah. Uh, I just have a question, I'm not sure. an officer. So when we are, I'm trying to do a reconsideration, I always ask for three mm -hmm. comps that are not on the appraisal report, at least one mile yes. radius, same sort of the kind of thing. Um, but I seldomly have an appraiser go and, and reconsider the, the value. Why, I mean, if they're giving good justifications, why, why not? Um, I always look at what I'm provided and I will, I will tell you, Hey, I didn't use this comp because, um, uh, it's not as similar or it's, uh, are, um, basically, um, uh, the one I had a appraisal, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, where the, um, sales price was 675. It was listed for 625. Um, and I got a, you know, I came in at 625 and sent it to the lender. Um, and basically the bar called me and asked me, Hey, why didn't you, why didn't you use these sales and these other subdivisions? Or and I said, well, basically because there was plenty of information in the subdivision that I used. Um, I had, uh, at least 20 sales, um, you know, all of them were similar in square footage. Uh, you know, yes, he had, uh, the sellers had updated the house considerably. I mean, they had put a lot of money into it and, it was very modern looking. It was a 14 year old home, but it looked like a house that, you know, Highland would build today, basically. And uh, I said, I couldn't justify going outside the subdivision when there was plenty of sales in the subdivision that were similar in updates, um, similar in square footage. And, you know, those led me to believe that the sales or the market value opinion should be 625. Um, so I will look at uh, anything that you provide me, um, but you know, um, and I will tell you why I didn't use those comps. Sometimes they're not comps that I that looked at originally. Sometimes they are, um, and but I will always give the lender a, a reason why, or the person who's um, asking for a reconsideration why. And sometimes, you know, I did miss something. Uh, uh, you know, I can use it in the appraisal report, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, one comp is not going to skew the value significantly. Um, I usually use, I usually try to use four comps uh, and then two listings, one or two listings in the report. And um, basically with those, I think that I, that thoroughly supports my value. Uh, and I will also write in the addendum why I use those sales and um, why I weighed the sales the way I did. Uh, just because I think that gives clarity to the reader. Um, you know, we're, we're not, well, you're the lender, but we're not writing it to the real estate agent or to the owner or to, uh, we're writing the report to the underwriter, basically, just to convince them that, hey, I covered all my bases here. Um, you know, it's, uh, I thoroughly researched this. Um, you know, could I be wrong? Yes, of course, but, um, but this is my reasoning behind what I did. Yeah. Sure. Could I ask you a question? I, this is this is a two-part question. Okay. Um, and then we'll get to these questions. So the, the first is um, just in an effort to do an accurate CMA for our clients, mm -hmm. right? 
we don't get to see obviously that each appraisal report for a particular neighborhood weighted a covered patio this amount mm -hmm. or gave a pool this amount, etc. So it's just kind of a best guess for us a lot of times. So are there certain like boundaries or limits that we need to be aware of? Like for example, hey, whatever you do, don't go outside of a one mile radius if you have to go outside of the neighborhood. Or, you know, uh, on square footage, once the house gets to X percent, maybe do 25% of square footage if you can't find plus or minus 200 square feet, mm -hmm. uh, years built, et cetera. So that, that would really be the, the first part of that. Okay. Um, yeah, on, on comps, um, the one mile, it depends on the neighborhood <laughs> uh, significantly. Um, like Timberwood Park, uh, there would be homes that are outside of a mile that I will use just because they're still in Timberwood Park. Um, but uh, some neighborhoods like Alamo Ranch, um, there's probably enough sales that I don't have to go that far out um, basically what I'm looking at is trying to find the most similar in square footage first, um, it's the most similar in square footage, most similar in age. Um, and if I can find the builder, you know, if it's a 10 year old home or less, you can usually figure out who the builder is and you can usually guess by looking at who the builder is, the construction quality. Um, well, usually, um, like if I'm doing a new build, I want to find something that's five years old or less. Uh, once you get two years to 10 years, that'd be another good range. 10 years to 20 years, I'd like to, you know, within 10 years is what I usually try to narrow myself with. But once you start getting older sales, um, like if you got 60 year old sales and seven year old sales, eight year old sales, nine year old sales, they're all the same uh, because they've been updated, um, you know, typically uh, if they're going to sell, um, you know, your, your home that's 60 years old and your home that's 90 years old uh, should have significant updates or similar updates. Uh, you know, they should have, you know, bathrooms and kitchens and stuff like that that are um, all the same. And then once you get that, you're dealing with construction quality. Uh, you know, did they go in and put marble countertops or, what did they do? What kind of flooring they have? You know, did they totally gut the house and um, you know make it look modern, or did they um, leave the original features of the house? You know, the house that was built in um, 1910. Um, and the, the areas that I'm talking about are almost Park, Alamo Heights, um, King William District. You know, where people want the original stuff, um, basically. Um, but yeah, uh, age, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a 60 year old home and compare it to a new home or even, even a 30 year old home. I wouldn't compare it to a, a new year home. Um, basically on new homes, what I like to do is find two builder sales, um, that are, uh, same builder, um, or, and a competing builder sale, uh, that's a similar construction quality and then include one resale. And then as my active listings or pendings use the same builder or sell or a competing builder sell. Um, and like I was saying, um, you know, on the, on the resale that I use, I would want it to be within five years. I can go up to 10 years, um, you know, as long as it's a well-maintained house and still support the value. Um, but yeah, once you get between five and 20 years, kind of want to use the same, similar ages, but I would still use, you know, 10 years is a good rounding point. Um, Square footage wise, um, you, you want to find the most similar square footage. Like if you have a 2,500 square foot home, you probably don't want to use a 4,000 square foot home. Uh, you probably want to use 3,500 or less. Of course, if you use an 1,800 square foot home, that's not really your same buyer either. Um, if you're looking at an 1,800 square foot home, three bedroom, two bath, it's probably not the same buyer as a 2,500 square foot, two story home. Uh, and just because, and that, they may be the same, but um, usually your one story, 1500 square foot home is single bar or newlywed couple. Uh, once you start getting up 2000, 3000 square foot, you're looking at family homes. And then of course your 3000 and over is just people who are established, um, have an established family, established career. And, uh, you know, they're gonna be looking at the bigger homes basically. Um, 
I mean, so the, what about the, the distance? No more than a mile? No, no more than um, I. If you can't be in the neighborhood. If you can't be in the neighborhood, I start out with a mile and see what I can find. Um, and if I can find similar construction, similar age, so much square footage, I use those before I'll search out three miles. Um, and the reason I do it that way is because Lynn, uh, on the appraisal report, lenders want to see stuff within a mile. And anytime you go outside of a mile, you have to explain why. Um, you know, if you go over to uh, Petranco right now, um, on the west side, uh, you may have to go farther than a mile just because the neighborhoods are spread out so far. Uh, when we go to New Braunfels, if we can't find something within a mile, we'll definitely go two or three miles. Like Vermindy, we'll use um, some of the nearest stuff that's off of 306. But Vermindy's picking up right now, and so we, we don't have to go outside of Vermindy anymore. Uh, but like uh, Vintage Oaks uh, is very big, so it's not unusual to use stuff that's two miles away. Uh, our stuff that's in um, Copper crust that's you know across 46. I would consider those two neighborhoods very similar uh, just because you know they're building a similar product um, and sometimes you can't find a new build um, in one subdivision so you'll go to another subdivision to find a new build uh, just because like if you're doing a DR Horton subdivision and they're the only builder in that subdivision you will have to go to another subdivision um, and find something to use as a competing builder. Uh, so mileage is not really a, a, a limiting factor. Uh, I said I won't use stuff that's five miles away. I will, um, but I have to have a good reason to use it. Um, but yeah, you'd probably want to keep something within a mile. Um, that'd be the best. Uh, lenders want to see what's most similar, uh, mostly, um, and if you can find that within a mile, that's great. But um, Going outside of a mile is not a. Not, so, not what a, about the so the second part is is the C and the Q score. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe expound upon that? Like if there's certain benchmarks that we need to be uh, cognizant of when we're walking at home and how we weight what we're doing in our CMA. Then, um, basically, you'll want to look at the kitchen and bathrooms. How are they finished out? Um, that's what I think. Um, most um, you know, buyers are looking at. Um, of course, your kitchen is always a room that everybody goes into first, looks at it and says, wow, this kitchen's really nice, or I don't like the countertops, I don't like the appliances, I don't like this, I don't like that. Um, and then you're looking at master bathroom. Hey, this is really nice. You know, This has this really nice big shower, really nice big tub, nice countertops, rather than, oh, this has a you know three by three shower, <laughs> so. Those two are the biggest factors, I think, that uh, I compare when I'm looking at comps. Um, how are those finished out? Then after that, it would be uh, flooring, interior paint. You know, how is this is this house modernized? Basically, um, what you know is, does it have? Um, you know, is it something that was built in 2000 and doesn't have you know the granite countertops? It has Formica. It doesn't have Powell backsplash or um stuff like that um those are the really big indicators of what you know pe people want to move into a house that's ready basically uh they don't want to move into a house and say hey i want to change the appliances or change the countertops uh, so usually when the uh, sellers have done that stuff you see those houses snapped up really quickly um, yeah i would wait those issues you know if you have kitchens that are the same bathrooms that are the same that tells you hey these houses are pretty similar they should be selling for similar prices. Basically. Did you have a question? Guys, I'm sorry, guys, when you ask questions, can you project because the microphone okay. is over there and so we want to pick them up, I'm going to attach it in anyway, which is uh, Well, first, do you, do you actually see the contract before you Yes. Start? Okay, so now, I, on, especially nowadays, like if you see a contract that's forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 over, does that already set expectations like, okay, I really got to dig deep here to uh, no uh, it doesn't um basically um the process that i go through is i get the order um i uh, they send me the address 
Um, sometimes I get the contract at that point. Sometimes the contract comes once I accept the order, but uh, they'll tell me the sales price or if it's a refinance, they won't tell me anything. And I'll look at it, uh, pull up the address, see if it's sold, uh, see if it's ever been listed. Uh, basically what I wanna know about the house is where it's at, how big it is, you know, what's a lot size. And through those factors, I determine um, is this house similar to other homes in the subdivision or is it unique to the subdivision? It's unique to the subdivision. I try to push it away <laughs> and not accept that order because it's a lot more work. But, you know, uh, if, if the lender does accept my uh, appraisal terms, you know, due date, uh, appraisal price, um, I look at, um, okay, so I have a, an issue now. Um, this one's selling for $50,000 above list price. Okay. Um, I look at everything in the subdivision, run sales for the subdivision. Okay. These don't really work. Okay. Um, what happens if I spend out a mile? Does these work? And, and um, do they, are they similar basically? Um, and if they are, then maybe I will use them. Um, if I could find uh, you know, cells that are similar out within a mile, that's fine. And even then I'll run the area, um, uh, you know, uh, area 18 or area five or area four, you know, I, I run it by that um, to see what's happening in that area. Um, last week I did one in Horizon Point that was selling for $20,000 above list price. Um, and I ran the whole area, whatever area it is down there, I can't remember. But um, there was no sales in that area. There were resales that sold for uh, that sales price. So that's telling me, hey, this isn't, this isn't gonna happen basically. And usually I tell the lender, hey, it's $20,000 of this price. I'm running sales. I, I'm not finding anything that supports this value. And um, I just give them a heads up in that point, portion. And sometimes they'll send, they'll, the realtor will send me stuff, um, but most instances now where we're seeing um, sales prices way over list price, the realtor already knows. But um, you know the, the people are coming to the table with a lot of cash, uh, usually, or you know they can renegotiate down to a lower sales price. So. Uh, I have two questions from sure. people on Zoom. Uh, Tony's is right there. I was at Heritage yesterday, and they are increasing their prices. Ten next week and the following week after that how will that affect it in seven months from now uh, on what was the rest of it when the house is complete um it depends on when the appraisal is done um if the appraisal is not done until well they're probably going to have an appraisal done at the end, um six months usually what we're seeing now is um lenders are ordering appraisals a month prior to the home being finished. And then we're going and doing a final uh, when the home is finished. Um, raising prices, 10 to $20,000. That doesn't seem excessive right now. Um, like I was saying, there was one builder who raised the prices 50,000. Um, in seven months, you know, hopefully they have the sales that can support it. Um, will they? I don't know. Um, is there anything outside the subdivision that I used to support that. Uh, that's a question seven months from now. Um, it's just hard to tell you because I can't project that far ahead um, to uh, get to that point. Um, if I could tell you that, I'd be doing something different. I'd be, I'd be uh, <laughs> working on Wall Street or something. But, yeah. yeah sorry. Um, <laughs> no, nope, oh. not quite. <laughs> um, and then. <laughs> And then Bobby Owens asked, can you talk a little about value for land loss and what increases value? For example, more value for hilltop views, huge oak trees, sloping lot detract value due to foundation prep costs. Um, yes, yeah, so a hilltop view usually will get um, a premium. Um, like uh, the most common subdivisions that we're doing a lot of appraisals in right now are uh, Canyon and Scenic Hills, uh, or Scenic Loop, um, and uh, that other new one, the big one, Centennial Ridge, Bella Oaks. Um, 
Centennial Ridge has some view lots and they're getting a really nice premium for those. Um, uh, Bella Oaks, I know is, um, I think it's mostly flat, but they do have huge oak trees on some lots and they will get premiums for those. Um, it's just hard to uh, answer how much at this point, um, just because uh, there's so many variable factors that go into um, those views and uh, you know the, the trees are they how big are the oak trees how many oak trees um, but those are some of the subjects we're looking at right now that um, you're, you can see definitely that those those in, those factors do influence um, the the sales price um, sloping lot yes that will have um, some effect um, usually if it's a huge slope. Um, I've seen some where you, you would think that it would affect the value just because you wouldn't want to build your house on that lot, but it doesn't. Um, builders can do things now that, uh, uh, you know, with the design of the homes um, to use the slope um, to enhance the architecture of the home. Uh, and you can see that and, you know, where they're building million dollar homes, of course, and uh, uh, Canyons and Scenic Loop. Uh, you're kind of looking at why would somebody buy this lot it's so chill well they went and built a really nice pool um you know really nice uh house that's you know basically one and a half stories where you have a game room downstairs that walks out into the pool and you know all the all your living areas upstairs um so yeah that does have an, an influence on the lot uh some but like i said it, it just depends on the buyer and seller um you know Somebody asked a certain price for it, and somebody was willing to give them a certain price for it. So, yes. To piggyback on Shane's question earlier for pools, like what do you guys value a pool? Don't value like uh, no, value a pool. Yeah, a pool does uh, increase the value uh, some. Um, right now, because construction costs are so expensive. Um, you're not going to get out what you put into it, obviously. Um, I, I haven't seen a pool under $70,000 in probably two years. Um, you know, you a $70,000 pool and you think, wow, that's going to be a nice pool. And then you go out there, it's just a rectangle, <laughs> you know, so, you, um, but uh, yeah, um, basically um, under $500,000, you're probably looking at maybe $30,000, $500,000, you're probably looking at $35,000. You just have to look at the comps and see. Is there a, like a percentage or a ratio? Not really a percentage or a ratio. Um, what I try to do is estimate the cost of the pool. Um, you know, if it's a small kidney shaped pool, it's not going to be, uh, I'm not going to give it a lot of consideration just because, um, you know, it, it's probably not selling for that much higher consider, you know, when you compare the comps. Uh, but if you have a really nice pool that has a spa with a beach entrance, you know, a place to put your umbrella, you know, permanent concrete chairs, you know, all these really nice features to it, then it's gonna get significantly more once you look at it, just because it will sell for more because it has like, a better appeal. Listing, would that take over for like invoices or receipts? Like would that be helpful? Yeah, if, if sort of yeah, if you can show your, uh, your, uh, you know, your potential buyers, hey, we spent $100,000 on this pool and we're only asking $50,000 over similar comps without pools, then they would probably see that as a good deal. I mean, yeah, 50% is a lot to get out of a pool, I would think. If you build a pool, you're mostly building it for your enjoyment. Um, you just have to look at um, what the comps say. I mean, um, sometimes you'll see, hey, this one, this pool's only worth fifteen thousand dollars because you know this house for the bull sold for only fifteen thousand dollars more. I mean yeah. but I, I leave a packets for real estate. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful because yes. I had like somebody say, oh you're gonna piss off the advisor. No. Uh not me. Not uh, me. Uh, well, I don't want to piss anybody off. I just want to make it easier so they can see where I came up with it. Uh, yeah it depends on the appraiser. I don't have any issue with you leaving something. Um some appraisers say, oh, you're trying to influence value. No, you're just providing, you know, what you saw. Yeah. And, uh, you know, usually if I'm coming up low previously <laughs> towards this year and I didn't, was looking at a sale and I couldn't make it and I'm like, what am I missing? I would contact the realtor and say, hey, what am I missing? Uh, how, why, 
Well, well, I, well, <laughs> well the reason I do that is because it's a lot easier to do that than to defend yourself down the road. Yeah. Um, because once I do an appraisal, I want to, I want to be done with it. I don't want to come back to it and, and revisit. Okay. Why did I do this? Why did I do that? Because usually my notes don't, um, <laughs> or not, <laughs> you know, three months down the road or two weeks later, I don't want to say, what was I doing here? Okay. This is why I did this. This is why I did this. Oh yeah. I remember this. You know, that's why I'm, I'm willing to accept anything. Because just so, so I see what you're thinking. So for pools, but also the dog for just as final, I guess for me on that, um, I've also been taught just as a general thought process that if your pool is in the majority, then it adds value. But if it's in the minority, it may not. Um, that's somewhat true. Um, like there are some areas, like if you go to some of the older areas, um, like Del View around 410. If a house has a pool, it may not add that much value just because, you know, you have smaller houses. Um, people are looking for, um, you know, the good value. Um, most of those houses right now are selling for 200,000 or less. So if you put a pool in there, you know, people who are buying that house don't want the upkeep, um, don't want to deal with it. So yeah, I could see in an issue where a pool is not gonna add a tremendous amount to that house. Um, and plus, it's probably just going to be a really small pool, uh, especially if it was built in the 70s. It's going to be one of the small kidney-shaped pools with concrete. So. Does the type of pool differ? Like a uh, um, fabricated pool versus? No, not, not necessarily. Um, our salt water versus chlorine, no. Right. Uh, you know, uh, your owners would probably say, well, I spent this much money. And, but your buyer that wants a pool, you know, they're going to either want that pool or not want that pool. Um, yeah. Yes. These homes that are being built with uh, air purification systems, mm -hmm. is that taken into consideration? Um, not individually, but um, as overall construction, we can factor that in. Uh, there's no uh, baseline on the price report that I can make an adjustment and say, hey, this one has a $5,000 more expensive air conditioning system, so I'm gonna upgrade it. And the reason I can't do that is because um, the MLS listings um, don't give me that much information. Uh, you know, if, I, if the owner tells me, well, I have an air purification system, well, I can't, you know, the five cells that I use, I can't tell you if they have the same system or not, or if they have a better system or anything like that. So I just can't really, um, factor that in, but, you know, if you have an air purification system, you know, really nice cabinets, really nice finish out on a new build. Uh, it's going to be seen in the construction quality uh, issue. Um, they're going to be, of course, they're going to cost more. So I'm going to go to the builder and say, hey, you know, this house is $50,000 more than this similar house that you built. Why? Well, you know, I put in these cabinets, I put in this air purification system, I put in um, you know, this type of wood flooring that costs $20,000 more, stuff like that. And then I can make those adjustments and justify uh, construction quality adjustment. And then what about solar panels? Um, solar panels right now, that's probably one of the other major issues we're dealing with. Uh, we're starting to see more sales with solar panels, but um, I think in the past three years, we've only seen one sale that has sold for higher just because it had solar panels when you compare homes across the board. Um, that's not to say that, um, you know, somebody's willing to come in and pay $10,000 more just because of solar panels, but right now we're not seeing the market support for it. Um, and basically there's many issues that go with that. Um, some are leased, some are bought, um, you know, uh, you know, if you bought it solar panels five years ago, they're obsolete now. So if you bought it solar panels a year ago, they're still pretty um, so over modern. So five years old, you consider them to be obsolete? I, yeah, well, as fast as it's changing, probably two years is obsolete now. Two years? Yeah, okay. I mean, that's just that's just my personal opinion. But, but um, it sounds like to me, it sounds like to me, and every question that we've asked mm -hmm. is really your personal opinion. Because there's, yes. there's really no like, guidelines that they say appraisers you've got to use this or you have this range to use 
and talk about it. It is my first one. Five different phrases here. I'm going to get five different answers. You probably would, yes. Yeah. Uh, but those five different answers say if you put a house on the market for 105, um, I may come in at 102, some I may come in at 105, some I come in at 107. It should be a pretty height. Um, you know, but what I'm saying is that they don't say, okay, to uh, 10 percent of square footage on homes under this, it's not like that. There's no appraisal no guidelines that tell you. No, that. there's no you guidelines yeah. uh, that tell me that. Um, basically, it's just my personal experience um, and looking at things in the market. Um, and, um, and that's why, you know, you have appraisers who will differ. Um, and it's it, basically there are some things, you know, there's the um, objective measurements, you know, your square footage, your lot size, your, um, you know, in ground pool, your bedroom, bathroom counts. Those, we should be pretty similar. They should be, you know, if I'm adjusting 2,500, somebody's adjusting 3,000, that's not a big difference. Um, or if I'm adjusting 30 foot and he's adjusting 35, there's no real issue there. Uh, what it comes into is um, when we're looking at construction quality, uh, I may think, yeah, this house is nicer because of X, Y, and Z. And he may look at it and say, no, this house isn't as nice because of X, Y, and Z. And that's the objective part, uh, or the subjective part, um, you know. Um, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, yeah, it is subjective. Um, you know, you can you can convince some appraisers that, hey, this house will tell, 250 is a great sales price. And I may look at it and say, wow, that's 250, that's way over, it's 235. You know? And it's just, the nature of the business, you know, and I, but for me to say 235, I have to support that value. And for him to say 250, he has to do the same thing. He has to support that. You know? what, what are you afraid of? What, what, what is the thing that, uh, when you look at an appraiser, you say, like, I don't want to go to jail, or I don't want to get my license revoked. Like, who watches that? Um, well, first of all, the state, um, if uh, you, um, the state board, Appraisal Licensing Board does call in appraisers constantly um, and have them review appraisals. Um, I I don't know of any appraiser personally that has ever had that happen to them, but um, every month they send out an email. Uh, the Texas Appraisal Licensing Board sends out an email and says, "Hey, these ten or these ten or these five appraisers had their license revoked because they didn't follow these paths." or they didn't do this or, um, you know, um, and um, basically what happens is the lenders will refer them to the state or, you know, um, maybe buyers will refer them to the state or this, you know, somebody who has received the appraisal looks at it and says, hey, this isn't good. Um, I want the state to look at it. So they'll refer them to the state uh, appraisal licensing board. And uh, usually an investigation happens. Uh, they do have appraisers on staff who will investigate, um, you know, okay, is this just somebody who's mad because the appraisal value didn't come in high enough or do they have legitimate concerns? Um, and when you're an appraiser trainee, uh, you have to, you keep a log book of all the appraisals that you did and you have to submit at the end of the, when you apply for your license, uh, the appraisal board asks for at least two samples of your appraisal reports. Um, one of my appraisers, um, that I worked with, whose appraiser's with us now, when he got his license two or three years ago, uh, they asked for two reports and um, they came back and said, hey, let us have another three reports. And they never said why. So they don't have to tell us why. So he had to submit three more reports that they pulled out and then said, okay, that's fine. So, uh, but most of the violations that we do see are reported are uh, every month are used patent violations. And, um, Usually for your first violation of use PAP, they just make you take use PAP again. Uh, then uh, after, if you're found to have doing the same thing over and over again, they'll uh, suspend your license for six months. Or if you did something egregious, like you didn't inspect the property or um, you can be shown that you knowingly did something um, that, you know, basically you lied about basically <laughs> um, that they will, uh, you know, suspend your license. Um, there are a few that have been permanently suspended, um, but once you get your license suspended for six months, you don't 
you won't be doing appraisals for six months, so you don't have any income, so you go do something else, basically. Uh, even if you do come back into the profession, um, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time finding clients uh, at that point uh, because on every um, uh, appraisal management company application that I get, it says, "Have you ever been suspended?" or are there any lawsuits pending against you? Or have you ever been convicted of a federal crime or a felony? You have to answer all these questions. So if you check no, well, you're probably not going to get that application approved. So that, that's basically uh, what, I'm, what am I afraid of? Um, yeah, getting my license suspended because that would, that would basically kill our business um, at that point. So. Now, I had a home that I listed in Chateau Park mm -hmm. and it was in the second phase. But one of the hard prop or one of the issues I had was finding enough comps because obviously there are not a lot of home sales in Chavano Park. So I tried going out as far as distance. I tried going back as far as time. In a situation like that, like for example, in that particular phase of Chavano, I think each of those homes was built by one of four or five builders. Mm -hmm. And I see the Canyon Scenic Loop being very similar at some point because there's mainly five or six builders in that development. So how do we accurately assess the value of a home when each home might be completely different? It might be Mediterranean versus Tudor versus contemporary, et cetera, in its architectural style, in its features, in the layout on the land, et cetera. How, what kind of guidance can you give us to be able to find as accurate as we can comps to be able to list that appropriately so we don't have some kind of shock at the appraisal time? Yeah. Um, the, uh, and something like the Canyons and Scenic Loop, uh, I would try to find similar builders. Um, you know, um, I know they're all. <laughs> multi-million dollar builders and there's a wide range of, of styles there's a wide range of uh you know floor plans one stories two stories views it's just it's just hard and I, I mean can't really say you need to do this or you need to do that um basically i would go probably something like that it's kind of hard to answer because Right now, I'm only doing new, I've only done new builds in there. Um, I've done a couple of refinances, but um, I mean, it's just I would try That's to find them. The yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would have to just find something that you, you consider to be most similar. Um, yeah, Mediterranean versus you know the contemporary. Uh, yeah, if you could find contemporary style homes, I mean, there's there's a lot in there now. Uh, when they first started building in there, they're probably more Mediterranean style. Um, and then there's Texas Hill Country style. Um, but you just want to probably find the, you know, something that you consider to be most similar. And then in that situation, say to the uh, appraiser, hey, this is what I used. Uh, you know, um, this is what I was looking at. Um, these are the comps that I used. And, you know, hopefully they'll be considerate of your opinion. Um, and, I, and that's another reason I'm considerate of um, a real estate agent's opinions because y'all know what's in the market. I mean, um, basically y'all came up with an idea of what it should be and somebody was willing to pay that. So there's where two minds are meeting. You know, that's two opinions coming together and saying, hey, this, this is a good deal. Um, so that weighs in my opinion as well. Um, but yeah, uh, just, just find something that's most similar, square footage wise, it's style wise, uh, you know. In a circumstance like that, is it appropriate, for example, to find a home that's in the Dominion that might be a similar architecture as one that's in the old part of Chapman? Um, when I do appraisals in the Dominion, I try to stick to the Dominion. And when I do appraisals outside the Dominion, I try to not use stuff in the Dominion. The only exception to that rule is when you get up to Three million. Um, when you get above three million, you're going to have to use all of San Antonio, Cordillera Ranch, just because there's very few properties. But uh, usually, a sale between a million, two million, and the Dominion, I stick to the Dominion as much as I can, and I, I will go back twelve six months, um, and even eighteen months if I have to, if the lender will allow it. Um, but yeah, Chavano Park, you want to stay in Chavano Park as well. Um, 
now there's a lot more sales in there, uh, thankfully. <laughs> but I do understand that, you know, yeah, you have homes that are 30 years old in there, and then you have really nice homes that are built in the 2000s that are millions of dollars. And so it's just hard. Um, from Shawano Park, depending on the house, um, if it's one of the uh, newer and nicer houses, um, I would probably go, gosh, I would have to look just basically the whole area. Uh, I would maybe go to Elm Creek or uh, Inverness to compare it. Um, just, you know, if it's a 1970s house, maybe Elm Creek because those houses are built older. If it's a newer, nicer house, Inverness would be more uh, comparable uh, subdivision to go to just because Inverness is newer and nicer, multi, you know, really nice big houses. It sounds like you're saying the bottom line is similar. Yes. Find as Find similar as you can be. As similar as you can be. Not similar yes. to Shabana's yes. common sense. Yes. Find something as similar as possible. Yes. Yeah. As similar in neighborhood yeah. I mean, I've told them the appraiser before they called me and said they can't find comps. And I said, well, what would you like me to do? Not sell a house? Find some comps. Yeah. You I mean, can, I'm going to sell a house. You can find some. That's, that's, that's the issue. You can find comps. You have to find comps. You have to. Yeah. Because, it, you know, um, the most extreme distance I'll go is 20 miles. And that's when I'm looking at acreage yeah. in um, Bernie, Comal County. Oh, yeah. yeah. When I've done 20 acres, you can't, you know, you're not going to find a 20 acre property within a mile of where you're at. If you do, that's, you know, that's a reason to throw a party because <laughs> it's just, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I do, when we deal with underwriters, we deal with underwriters all over the United States. You know, when I send off a report, I don't know where it's going to go to be underwritten. Um, I try to explain, hey, this is rural Colmel County. Um, you know, you, you can't find comps within five Doing miles. Yes, yes. And, you know, if you get a good underwriter, they'll look at it and, and say, yeah, I understand. But, you know, some underwriters, um, you know, they got to put the, they're trying to put a round peg into a square hole, basically, or square peg in a round hole. Um, and they want, they got to check off all their boxes. And that, you can't do that sometimes. Um, I did an appraisal uh, for refinance that back to the San Antonio River, the Riverwalk extension a couple of weeks ago. And there are no, well, there's one sale now that backs to the Riverwalk, but it doesn't back to the Riverwalk extension. Uh, the last sale that I could find that I could verify closed 10 years ago and I used that sale and they asked me why. And I was like, it's the only sale that has back to the San Antonio Riverwalk extension within the past 10 years. And so, and, and yeah, finally they, they understood <laughs> that, hey, there's nothing, I mean, there's probably 10 houses that do that. Can you ever use the county appraisal? Um, like the county appraisal value? No, I don't look at those. Uh, I mean, I know we have to pull the VCAD to get the information, but um, I don't, Put any weight to those because uh, they're often wrong, um, yeah. and that's why people challenge them. <laughs> yeah, I'm always saying because I, I get a listing and I'll do the CMA, and then they just tell me, "Well, why are you putting it at X mm -hmm. amount when the appraisal says it's thirty thousand or whatever yeah. more, and you can't even sell it for that?" So when they go to protest, we give them the CMA and mm -hmm. then we look at. It. Oh, really? Um, I, we do probably maybe one to two uh, appraisals for uh, tax purposes a year to uh, basically um, the, the, the best uh, way to go about that is to hire a company that specializes in that. And one of the best is Arthur Vindman and Associates. Arthur Vindman and Associates here in San Antonio. Um, they are a company that does that. Um, I think they do other things like tax, they deal with tax issues basically. And uh, one of my good friends who's a tax attorney uses them to protest his taxes every year. And uh, he's had really good success with it every year. Uh, that's, that's the first way I deal with the problem. I recommend that people go through them. Um, but if they really want an appraisal and I can't dissuade them from using us um, or going that route, then we do all do the appraisal for them. Um, but yeah, it usually, and usually, um, you know, people can see, hey, this house down the street is praised for less than mine. 
and I don't think mine's you know that nice. Uh, so you know I'll use all these factors in my house. I need new flooring. I need new carpet, or I need an updated kitchen. Uh, my windows are all fog. Issues like that, and they take pictures to the appraisal board and use it that way. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't put um, weight in a CMA. Um, they should uh, because it does have accurate market data, and they're they're not you know they're just doing an overall assessment. Okay, prices rose X, so this house is going to rise X, and then factor in, yeah, so drive by and look at it. And, they're giving more value to our land. Mm -hmm. in you know, subdivision here, but we can't recoup that like in CMA. Uh, the, oh, well, our land is worth more now. Yeah, uh, because there's few lot sales available um, that we look at. Um, I, the, we're allowed to do two basic land assessment values. We can do what's called. Um, mm -hmm. um, well, first, the best way to determine land value is to have sales, land sales. You know, if you have a big subdivision like Timberwood Park or, um, you know, uh, or near a subdivision, Canyons, St. Luke, um, you know, uh, uh, Vintage Oaks, and you could pre pretty much determine the land value when you're looking at it because you're going to have sales of similar uh, sales just because there's a ton of sales and land sales. Uh, so you can uh, derive the value that way. Um, the second way we determine value is allocation. And basically, it's just a guess. Uh, what you do is you say, well, it would cost X to build this house. So X minus the value is this. X minus um, the value equals the land. So that's how we get allocation. And you do that with each sale that you use, and then you determine a percentage most common percentage we've come up with is around 20%. Um, of course, you start getting almost park on the heights, it's gonna be much higher, 30, 40%, sometimes fifty percent But the allocation method is, is another way to determine the land value uh, that we use. And um, it's probably not as accurate, but it's a it's a way that you can determine, you know, give weight to it's a thought out process basically that we could give weight to. Um, but yeah, um, how they're determining land values at the county level, I don't know. Um, I mean, they're probably just using the allocation method saying, okay, everything went up X percent, so land value went up X percent as well. I'm going to have Jenny ask the final piece. I saw your hand up. Ask one last question for your time. Sure. Go ahead, Jenny. So, talking about like the Yeah, the best question for last. Oh, that, that's a complicated question. Um, It probably, I probably wouldn't look at zoning <laughs> during my assessment because 99.9% um, .9 of the time, it's not gonna make a difference because I'm using residential sales, um, you know, in, in similar subdivisions. So they're all gonna be R5, R6, R4, based on their lot size. Um, so you're, so if everything in the neighborhood is uh -huh. and, and then, then um, using the single family compared to that, it would be using the single family compared to a single family compared to a triplex or a duplex. Uh, and basically the reason that is is because when you have a multifamily property, um, you're doing the appraisal on a separate form. Uh, we're doing the appraisal on a um, uh, multi-family appraisal report, which is a 1025 form, and uh, the typical residential single-family form is a 1004. Uh, so it only allows you to compare uh, single-family residences to, um, you know, single-family residences and multi-family properties to multi-family 
uh, it's going to be used in those forms. So, like, yeah, I wouldn't, I couldn't do that um, because I'm not looking, I wouldn't be looking at your, um, it, it'd be considered triplex because there's three separate units, three separate, I guess they're three separate meters, probably. Um, if there's one meter, then that's a big <laughs> issue. Um, so, one meter, so the meter does. The, the meter would, yes, make an issue. Um, yeah. 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 So yeah, you have a very complicated issue right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what we're told is for a um, multifamily property is you have to have three distinct units or you know, at least two distinct units and those units must be separately metered. Now that doesn't always happen, you know, two or more units separately metered. Now that doesn't always happen because you have duplexes that are 50, 60, 80, 100 years old and they only have one unit to sell, share the cost. And it, it, when you get to that point, it gets really complicated. Um, and basically, uh, you're looking at the lender and saying, hey, this property is complicated because it is a duplex, but it's only has one meter. And then they'll. So, 80 Yes. Yeah. You won't have a, you won't have a new. Yeah, based on zoning or based on common building standards, you won't have that issue. Uh, but uh, it, it's, yeah, it's a very complicated area. So, so to that, also, uh, you know, some kind of new buildings and properties that are residential currently that have commercial potential, mm -hmm. right? People have the title price that. How do you guys take that? We have to. Okay. Yes, in that situation, um, if it's zoned commercial, I would have to defer to a commercial appraiser uh, just because of, of that issue. Um, if it's zoned residential, then I would have to determine what the highest and best use of the property is. Um, and if I determine the highest and best use is commercial, then um, I have to decline the assignment and refer it to a commercial appraiser. Um, where, yeah, I mean, I, I've come across this issue before and it's very complicated as well because you have to determine the highest and best issue. And when you're looking at the highest and best uh, use of the property, basically is, is it was this house sell more as commercial or would it sell more as residential? What does it appeal at? Um, yeah, there's a ton of houses on St. Mary's <laughs> and uh, downtown that you run across this issue uh, because there's own residential, but you know a, a lawyer has set up a shop in there, or has set up an art shop, or just you know maybe a small restaurant or something. And in most of those cases, I just go ahead and defer and tell the lender, hey, the highest and best issue of this property is probably commercial. You need to assign this to a commercial appraiser. And the reason that's an issue is because I can't uh, appraise commercial properties. And um, there's also separate lending requirements for commercial property. So um, like you can't get a residential loan on a commercial property. Are the commercial properties, do they have like the, like the knowledge to be residential? Yes, yes, um, as a, res a commercial, um, yes, yeah. well, when I say commercial, I'm talking about certified general appraisers. They have the ability to appraise any properties. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you. No, it's, it's okay. I'll leave my card up here. If y'all have any questions at any time, please feel free to email me or call me um, for any issues. Um, yeah, FHA, I'm willing to. Uh, I, I'm willing to answer any FHA questions you have or any general appraisal questions.